All right. Well, good evening, everybody, uh, and welcome to our uh, pastor's Bible study. Uh, if you're joining us on Facebook Live, you can follow a link to a study guide that those of us who are here at the church uh, property in the community room are, are using as the basis of our study. And let me just say tonight at the outset, we, we had taken a week off for spring break. Uh, we're back tonight, and then next Wednesday night is Holy Week. And so in lieu of the regular Wednesday night study, uh, we're going to have a special uh, prayer time and communion time. And we're still going to be meeting in this room. It's going to be fairly informal, uh, but it'll give us the opportunity to celebrate Holy Communion during Holy Week. And then the majority of our time is going to be dedicated to praying for our weekend services, Good Friday and Easter, because we're expecting them. Uh, great time together as we celebrate the Lord's resurrection. So anyway, hope you'll come back next week for that communion prayer service. And then the following week, Wednesday after Easter, we're going to wrap up our series on the Ten Commandments. Okay. So with that, let's uh, pray and commit our time to the Lord. Dear God, our Father, we thank you for uh, this time that you've given us to come apart uh, in a busy week to study your word and to fellowship with one another. And God, as we look at uh, one of the Ten Commandments tonight, uh, it reveals something about you and how you want us to relate to you and to others. And so, God, we ask that uh, by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would be our teacher and that you would guide us to your truth. Uh, we pray also for the youth and the children that are meeting here in the building tonight. And I pray that it would be a t great time of learning for the entire Lynn Haven United Methodist Church. And even for folks uh, beyond the walls of this building uh, that are joining us on Facebook or watching this later when it's posted online, uh, God, we just pray that uh, you would use this time together uh, to accomplish your will in our lives. And uh, God, we bring to you all our praises, but we also bring to you uh, our burdens and concerns. We pray tonight for folks who are sick, who are suffering, uh, who maybe uh, are mourning the loss of a loved one or Maybe he's simply feeling a bit downcast. And we entrust all those people and all those situations into your care and pray that uh, you would provide for each one of those persons uh, out of your abundant riches and glory. And all this we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, once had somebody tell me that there are three ingredients to a successful marriage. It's communication, communication, communication. And what's true of marriages is true of all relationships. Uh, good communication is necessary uh, if we're going to thrive. And how many times have you heard an explanation given for a divorce or maybe the end of a friendship, the estrangement from family members, uh, someone saying we just couldn't communicate or we had a breakdown in communication? Well, the Ten Commandments, which we're studying, uh, are all about relationships. We've pointed out the first four deal with what relationship? Our relationship with God. The next six deal with our relationships with one another. And so it shouldn't surprise us that at least one of them, namely this ninth one, uh, protects the integrity and the power of communication. And I've got it listed on your uh, outline, but here it is in the New Living Translation. You must not testify falsely against your neighbor. Some of us learned it in the King James. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. The one that I like best is from the contemporary English version. You shall not tell lies about others. Okay, That really gets to the heart of the matter. And the original recipients of God's law, the Israelites, knew that this ninth commandment primarily applied to a court of law where truth-telling was a matter of life or death. There were serious consequences when you were brought before a tribunal in the nation of Israel. And it usually was a matter of life or death. And so people were expected to tell the truth. But they also understood that it went beyond that courtroom setting uh, to cover the entire realm of human relationships. And in a way, the whole world is a courtroom uh, because anywhere and everywhere, reputations are constantly on trial. You know, in a formal courtroom, oaths are taken. There's a judge present to make sure everything is done fairly. There are lawyers present to try and represent each side. All the charges are made publicly. Questions can be asked. Rebuttals can be given. 
But in daily conversations, we don't have those kind of safeguards, do we? Uh, the only protection for somebody's reputation and for personal security is the kind of integrity that we see embodied in the ninth commandment. It's our in integrity. It's human. It's our truth telling. And there's probably no sin that's as popular as telling and spreading lies about other people. And the reason it's so popular is it's really easy to do, isn't it? Because we always have a suitable weapon with us. It's our tongue. And this sin kind of seems innocent compared to the others. Uh, most of us wouldn't hit somebody else over the head, but we'd kill their reputation with words. We wouldn't take somebody's possessions. We wouldn't steal from them. But we would steal and take away their pride or their dignity. So uh, I just want to share with you three ways that we violate this ninth commandment. Okay, and they're listed again on your outline. The first one, obvious, it's just telling a lie. The Bible makes it real clear. Paul gets right to the heart of the matter. He just says it real explicitly. Stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth. Ephesians 4, 25. Now, before you decide you're not guilty of telling lies, let me just share a few facts with you. I don't know if you've ever heard of a book. It was written, it's now been, I think, a couple decades ago. It was called The Day America Told the Truth. And it was based on a series of surveys and kind of just got folks really to be very honest. And then the authors put together their findings and it kind of revealed what a snapshot of America looked like. Okay, here's some of their findings. 91% of Americans admit that they routinely lie about matters that they consider trivial. 91% lie, okay, about trivial matters. 36% lie about important things. And I don't know about you, but that begs the question in my mind, who's getting to decide what's trivial and what's important? What you might call trivial, I think is really important and vice versa. And who do we lie to? 86% uh, of us lie to our parents. And so if your kids lie to you about something, don't be flabbergasted, okay? Now, this is the case where everybody really is doing it, okay? 75% of us lie to friends, 73% lie to siblings, and 69% lie to spouses. That's pretty phenomenal, isn't it? And many of those lies are really just inconsequential. Did you turn the lights off in there? Yeah. yeah, we don't even think anything about it. Uh, but even those small lies are detrimental to authentic relationships. Uh, Scott Peck has written a, a book called The Different Drum, and he has an interesting theory about relationships. He says that God designed us for open, honest, communal. That's the operative word, communal relationships in community with each other. But he says that we tend towards pseudo-communal relationships. That means false community. And these are marriages and friendships, family relationships that are purely surface level. And nobody says anything that's unsafe to the other parties. Uh, and so we don't want to discuss misunderstandings. We don't air hurt feelings. We don't reveal frustrations. And the rule in pseudo community is just don't rock the boat. Don't disturb the peace even at the expense of the truth, even if it means telling a lie. And the reason is, is our preference as human beings is to peacekeeping rather than truth telling. Okay. And I think, you know, some people carry it to an extreme. There's some folks that I wish they would apply that principle more about peacekeeping. Uh, but by and large, that's true. We're more about keeping the peace than we are telling the truth. And so we'll do anything to avoid conflict. Okay, let me give you some examples. If I told my boss what really happened, he'd blow a stack. Okay? And so we don't. If I told my husband now how I really feel about his traveling, he'd say I'm, un I'm ungrateful for the way that I provide for the family. Okay? If I told my wife what I really think of her choice of friends, well, she'd call me controlling. If I told my parents how much I dislike college, they'd be upset and say I'm lazy. Y'all follow that kind of reasoning? We do that in a lot of our relationships. And as a result, we lie to each other and we settle for inauthentic relationships. 
And when you buy peace at the price of truthfulness, well, disaster isn't far away because what ends up happening is anger and frustration replace love and affection and the relationships will deteriorate. We just put off the deterioration of those. You know, rather than having our boss blow up with us, well, we keep it from him. But what happens when he does ultimately find out? It makes matters worse. And so I've listed on your outline uh, some of the ways that we settle for less than truthful uh, communication. And I've called these pseudo-community residents. And uh, honestly, I, I don't even know. I had this in a file on truth-telling and the ninth commandment. And I don't even, I didn't invent these. I think, as I recall, it was in a, uh, a sermon by Bill Hybels that I first heard these. He was the pastor of Willow Creek Community. So, well, Bill Hybels gets the credit for them. I don't know whether he did or not. I might be telling a lie there. <laughs> I'm not going to lie and say I did it. So, okay. All right. So there's Harry the Hint Dropper. You know this guy? Outright truthfulness is upsetting. It's crude. So he has this elaborate, ingenious plan to accomplish the same result. Okay. His wife has gone back to work. Okay. She's trying to balance now her job, the kids, her husband, the house, the meals, the cleaning church responsibilities and poor Harry a typical husband is guess what he's feeling neglected so is he going to tell her that no instead he says you know honey I'm thinking about buying some uh, stock in Stouffer's you know the folks who make these wonderful frozen dinners we now eat all the time <laughs> oh look here's an ad for rent a wife maybe I ought to call them okay now does his method keep the peace any of you that are married? No, it does not. And hidden hoppers just postpone the inevitable confrontation. They add insult to injury along the way. Then there's Mary the manipulator. Okay, She tries to should her husband into what she thinks a husband should do. Oh, John, uh, Jimmy's teacher said you should help him with his homework. She doesn't say anything about it. She just says, oh, the teacher says you should. John, I read an article about how much, men, how much men watch TV. You really should consider cutting back on your TV watching. Maybe you should read more. Oh, John, my doctor says that middle-aged men like you really should watch their diet and exercise more. Well, how does that go? Well, John will get enough and ultimately may tell her she should go find another husband that's more to her liking. Manipulators deceive people about their real feelings and that produces guilt and resentment in others. Okay? There's Steve the Stonewaller. Okay? And that's not Steve Nelson the Stonewaller. This is purely for the sake of fiction. Okay? Uh, Steve's in the room, by the way. When there's a problem, he pouts, he groans, he slams lots of doors. If other people notice and ask him what's wrong, what does he say? Nothing. And if there was, I don't want to talk about it. Okay? And then there's his twin sister, Sarah, the stonewaller. When she's confronted, she just whimpers, oh, I'm okay. And then sighs as she walks away. And then there's Ellen, the evader. She doesn't say anything. She just walks away. She just disappears from friendships, from family relationships. And uh, I found this uh, person is oftentimes present in a lot of churches. They this might get their feelings hurt. They might disagree with something and just poof, they're just gone as if they never existed. And when you ask them why they haven't been around or what's going on, they'll say, well, I've been busy or something else. Evaders never tell the truth and they risk the death of a, of a relationship, but they just kind of, the death is a slow one. They just kind of fade away. And so if we want to enjoy healthy, authentic relationships, we've got to quit telling lies to one another. And a quote from Ephesians 4.15, speak the truth in love. Okay? And uh, that's a whole other sermon, but two parts. Speak the truth, but do it in love. I used to have some guys at my former church. They were my two lay leaders, and these guys were honest to a fault. Okay? And I remember a few times having to tell each one of them, Hey, I know what you're telling me is the truth. I just don't feel a whole lot of love right now. 
<laughs> could you just amp up the love just a little bit and maybe I can handle the truth. Let me also say, we don't have to tell the truth about everything. Okay? There's something called what? Tact? You ever heard of that word? There's some things that just don't have to, to be said. Okay? And uh, even as I was putting this together, y'all know I'm a big fan of Seinfeld. And I think of that, I think of Kramer as the guy that just always tells the truth. And there's one episode where uh, Jerry is dating this uh, very pretty lady and, and he said so and she's talking about wanting to get a nose job and they say something about you know well what do you think of her and she's in the room and he says oh well you're a beautiful woman you just got a huge nose you know, <laughs> you know well it was the truth but you know didn't need to be said okay so there's a telling the lie secondly they're spreading the lie here's a later a few chapters later these ten commandments get fleshed out in more detail Exodus 23 you must not pass along false rumors be sure never to charge anyone falsely with evil now somebody has said that gossip is the sin of choice for most christians and we can commit this sin in a variety of ways one of them is passing on information without checking the facts i've heard that how many times do we say that in our side i've heard and we're not sure yeah, it might be true that you heard it, but we don't know whether what you're going to fill in the blank with is true. Uh, we contribute to false rumors when we don't stop hurtful, slanderous speech, when we don't speak up, when we know something is untrue. And again, go back to that. We like keeping the peace, so we won't confront people and say, hey, wait a minute, you know, we, you really don't need to be saying that here, or do you really know whether that's true? And this type of false testimony, uh, oftentimes in the church, takes the form of prayer request. You ever heard that one? Let's take prayer request tonight. Uh, can we pray that Ann's dad will stop beating her? Okay. Okay. Is that the prayer request, or are you trying to make a wish? Uh, we should ask God to help Bob with his drinking problem. Okay. Well, I uh, don't think those are helpful. Uh, prayer request when names are named. Uh, the spreading of lies can take place in some really kind of subtle ways. It's through half truths and sowing doubt. You know, for teenagers, boy, well, guys really like her. Oh yeah, you know why, don't you? Okay. I mean, again, jump to your own conclusion what that means. Oh, he sure is nice. Well, yeah, but look at what he's getting out of it. That's why he's acting that way. And you can even take true statements and weave them together and create an untruth. I heard a story about on a ship, the first mate one day wrote in the logbook, the captain was sober today. The second mate read it and said, hey, does the captain have a drinking problem? Didn't say anything. Later, the first mate goes to the executive officer and says, you know, funny thing happened. Somebody asked me today if the captain has a drinking problem. What do you make of that? Now, what's the implication? What are those other two folks going to, what's the conclusion going to draw? That he does have a drink, but nothing, there's nothing, no evidence of it. He just simply said, you know, I can tell you, you could write that in the book every day. Craig is sober today. Okay, and that's been true for about the last 38 years or something counting. Okay, that, that's just true, but it creates a false impression. Okay, uh, this type of lying is a sin. Why? Because it hurts somebody. It destroys reputations and opportunities, communities, and sometimes even lives. And uh, wow, this is a... Uh, there's such a scary thing about social media, especially in the hands of adolescents and teenagers. I mean, y'all are aware of it, right? We've had right here in Bay County at least two suicides that I know of among young people, school age, because of things that were being said about them on social media. They didn't know how to respond except just to, to take their own lives. And so it's just essential that we refrain from it in any form. Uh, here's Paul's advice. Stop telling lies. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. Uh, I just said one of my best friends and the, my former uh, 
former pastor with me at uh, the church I served in Alabama. His favorite verse is Ephesians 4.29, and he had, does some great talks on that about, you know, everything be good and helpful. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of you. You ever heard that? Mm -hmm. uh, so that your words will be an encouragement. That's a great verse to live by. That whatever you say, that is it going to encourage somebody? And because he talked about that so much, we formed an, a Cub Scout troop at the Mulder United Methodist Church, and we named it Cub Scout. It was Troop 429. Okay? And it was pretty cool. All the kids knew what it stood for, that it meant in the scouting group, you were to talk to each other in a wholesome way and in a way that encouraged each other. Okay? And let me just say that sometimes even the truth doesn't need to be shared uh, because it's not an encouragement to those who hear. Okay, And so, yeah, it could be true, but telling about somebody that just got fired or who got arrested, okay, is that going to encourage that person that that news is, is getting out? Okay, And you've probably heard this, love this quote, the reason a dog has so many friends is because he wags his tail and not his tongue. Okay. So take that and decide what to do with it. Live in a lie. Okay? So tell a lie, you can spread a lie, you can live a lie. And this is maybe the greatest lie that we'd ever be involved in. It's not what we say, but it's the one that we do. Here's John in his first epistle. He says, We are lying if we say we have fellowship with God, but go on living in spiritual darkness. We are not practicing the truth. And the living of a lie is the lie of deceiving ourselves and deceiving other people. And I've listed on your outline two ways that we can do that. The first one is when we seem to be what we are not. Okay? When we seem to be what we're not. We try to project an image. And we use exaggeration, pretense, or this happens a lot of times in the church. You know, I can just tell you, especially when I was a teenager, uh, I grew up in the church. I knew the right things to say. Okay? I knew all the right answers to give. I knew what to say to when I was asked questions and I was pretending to be something that I wasn't. I was just pretending to be a Christian. Okay? Uh, I heard a story about a young lawyer. Uh, he set up his new office. He sees a prospective client coming down the uh, hallway. He decides he's going to try and impress this potential client. So he picks up the phone, he shouts into it, he says, I couldn't possibly take your case for less than a $10,000 retainer. He hangs up the phone and asks the guy that comes in, what can I do for you? He says, uh, nothing, I'm from at and I'm here to hook up your phone. Okay? <laughs> you know, we can just try and put on airs, but we fool nobody but ourselves. We certainly don't fool others, we don't fool God. Okay, we can also seem to be or seem not to be what we really are, okay? We seem not to be what we really are. We think everybody else needs to hear the sermon. And again, we've probably all done that, right? Man, I wish so-and-so was here today to hear this, or now we can say, you need to, we can call somebody, and we can tell you, say, you need to go online, and I think you'll really get a lot out of this, right? Okay? Uh, and the reason we think everybody else needs to hear it is why? Because everybody else is sinners, but not us. Okay. Uh, another story about a pastor. He saw these two boys, and they were arguing, and they seemed to be vying over a puppy. And they had a puppy, and they were arguing. And he says, what are you doing? And they said, well, we found this puppy. We're trying to decide who gets it. And we decided whoever can tell the biggest lie wins the dog. And the pastor said, I can't believe you're doing that. That's awful. He said, when I was your age, I never told a lie. And the little boy says, here, preacher, he's yours. You, you win. Okay? If we, here, John, 1 John 1, 8, if we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. That's a pretty good one, right? That's worth it. If we claim to have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves. And so as Christians, we need to refuse to live a lie by seeming to be what we're not or seeming not to be what we are. We have to recognize who we are. Who are we? We are sinners saved by God's grace. Uh, we have been made into the saints of God, but we still sin. And so we're in need of God's mercy and his forgiveness. And when it comes to this sin of lying, we're all guilty. Here's the way it's stated, Psalm 116, 11. Everyone is a liar. 
in some form or fashion, at some point in our lives, we all either tell a lie, spread a lie, or live a lie. So what are we to do about it? Well, Paul makes it real clear, right? Stop telling lies. And here's how it's stated in the message paraphrase. I like this one. When this adds up, what this adds up to then is this. No more lies, no more pretense. Tell your neighbor the truth. In Christ's body, we're all connected to each other after all. And when you lie to others, you end up lying to yourself. So let's tell each other the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. And uh, the reason, I didn't hit this early on, but we said every one of these commandments reveals something about God, right? You and I are to be holy as God is holy. What do we know about God? Does he lie? He's an absolute truth teller. And so you and I are to tell the truth because God tells the truth. Okay? And since he is the uh, absolute truth, he can help us fulfill this ninth commandment. And I've quoted a couple psalms there. Uh, Deliver me, O Lord, from lying lips, from a deceitful tongue, and uh, guide me in your truth, and teach me. Um, that's uh, it for the lesson that, that I have. I'll take some questions. There are study questions if you're watching uh, at home or in some other location. Uh, you can look on that study guide. There's some discussion questions. Uh, that you can either uh, review yourself or maybe get with a family member or friend and review. We'll do some of that here in this room. Uh, let me also just say, uh, kind of, I'll go into overtime. This one's free. Is uh, I, I share something similar a lot of times when I, I've talked to teenagers on this side. I remember talking to our youth group and kind of using this same outline about telling lies, spreading lies, and living a lie. And uh, I like to give some practical help. How do you, because it is, especially for young people, it is so easy just to lie. Real, even innocent little thing. You know, and I know for many of y'all parents, aren't you amazed? I mean, at, you know, I remember my mom would always tell me, you know, you lie, Craig, when the truth would sound better, you know? And uh, it's like, it just doesn't, you know, make any sense. But, but here's a practical way. And this is applicable to kids, but also for us as adults. Uh, that if you catch yourself in a lie, immediately correct it. Okay? That's one of the ways to overcome it. So, so it becomes a simple thing. And again, I hazard guess most of us do that. And if you'll just become aware and ask God, you'll be surprised at how many just little lies you, you tell. You know, did you check the mail today on the way in? You know, we, we just don't even think about it. We just say, yeah. Well, if you realize that, just go back in a few minutes and say, you know, honey, I, I don't know why I did it. I was stupid, but, you know, I didn't check the mail. You all with me? If you'll just start correcting every one of those Im immediately when you become aware of it, uh, it, will, it will stop it. Okay? Uh, and also, I, I want to say uh, here, I go into overtime part two. Um, the, uh, another incentive is to kind of uh, reward or at least not punish the telling of the truth. Okay, and let me give you an example of that. Most of y'all know I went to the Air Force Academy. Uh, you go in there, again, look at these statistics about lying. But we take a, a vow that we will not lie, steal, or cheat, or tolerate anyone who does. And so you come from a background of lying, now you gotta, well, Lying at the Air Force Academy or in the military schools is the death sentence, essentially. It's automatic removal, okay? So that's the, it's pretty harsh punishment, so watch what you do, okay? And, but what happens is that other offenses, if you will tell the truth about them, none of them will, well, I shouldn't say that. There's probably some offense, but most offenses will not result in that severe a punishment. Y'all follow me? So if you, you know, I'll just use an example, not that I know anything about this one, but uh, there's regular, you're not allowed to drink alcohol in the dormitory, okay? But if you get caught drinking alcohol in the dormitory and you say, were you drinking in the dormitory? Just ask, were you drinking? And you say yes, well, you'll get punished, but you won't get expelled for that. Y'all follow that? Mm -hmm. And so try and work that into with kids that if they tell the truth, they don't get the death sentence, okay? They get some lesser punishment that will encourage them 
Because a lot of times that's what we just see no alternative. It's like, well, yeah, might as well lie because, okay, I'm in trouble either way. Okay. So anyway, that didn't cost you anything. That was extra. That was for free.